Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops, with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does Psyops fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that first and foremost, PSYOP saves lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOP. They think it's something deviant and brainwashing. you don't know exactly what's going on right now but we do know that there are some psyops going on right ma'am i don't know cinema psyops and i believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today why i believe that is because i know how it feels i know what it does to you cinema psyops they think it's something devious and brainwashing Welcome to the 296th consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host, Court. I'm trying my best to stay awake, even though we're starting an hour late tonight. And joining me in this journey to stay awake, because we're both old, is my co-host, Matt. God, it's like, I need to go to bed so I can get up for the early bird special. I eat dinner at 3 o'clock, because that's before the ruffians come out. (laughs) That's damn right, sir. Damn right. Damn ruffians. They've ruined uh, 3 o'clock. I don't know. It's a little late. 2.30 is typical what time, and that's a late snack for me. What I like to do is have a big breakfast. (laughs) Yeah, I'm really not that tired. I don't know why I went that route, other than I just wanted to start the show by automatically (laughs) diming you out and bitching about you making it late. Uh, Well, I'm sorry. I had to work man <laughs> job shit yeah well and i got my covid shot today number one baby oh yeah we're both one down that means in studio yep. times coming the fuzzy fun times is gonna be the, back soon. the fuzzy fun times will be back <laughs> yeah i'm gonna have to build you that isolation booth i've been threatening you with for like ever i'm gonna give you your own robin booth yeah uh, probably i don't see why you wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> well, if nothing else, it blocks out most of you, so I don't have to actually look at you. Uh, that would be nice, too. That's been the, that's been the main advantage to this uh, social distance recording of almost an entire year. I think it has been over yeah. an entire year. Yeah, it's been a more than a fiscal year of cinema psyops that has been forced to be away because of this, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's insane. That's, that's, uh, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, because cin- at Cinema Psyops, we're doing it the way the CDC originally recommended. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> we're, we're staying as far away from everyone we possibly can for the rest of our lives. I, I think that's just the best way to have that. <laughs> and by CDC, I mean court's death <laughs> clinic. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Because <laughs> I'm going to die I alone. Mean, that's, that works out. No, we can fucking cats will at least be there. <laughs> They'll eat my face, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to pad out the episode too much because I feel like we're going to have a lot to talk about with this movie. This we is- should. This is 
This is a good one. This is a film that has been heralded for quite a long time. And it's also a film that very clearly was the basis for not only story, but right out sheets for scene. <laughs> His fight sequences heavily lifted and repurposed by Quentin Tarantino for Kill Bill. Uh, there is a lot of shots that is yeah, crazy I mean, how much of this stuff is he has used. Literally, the, the way the action goes is kind of, there you go. Dude, characters, plot points, some of the visual cues, the overall yeah. structure, the way that it, it chops up and, and back and forth. He clearly wanted to make his own version of Lady Snowblood. It had to be. Yeah, I mean, it had to be. But that's not the only reason just to talk about this film. There's a lot of other stuff. For instance, the manga that this comes from, and I put this in the show notes if anybody actually fucking read them, is written by the same writer who wrote the manga that the Lone Wolf and Cub series was based on. Lone Wolf and really? Cub movie series. Yeah, which a lot of people would know as Shogun Assassin here in the States. They they cut up, I think, one or two. I think it's like the first two um, Lone Wolf and Cub films and turned it into Shogun Assassin. And then Shogun Assassin 2 is like like parts of the uh, next two films or whatever. But there's like six in a series and they're called the Lone Wolf and Cub or Baby Card Films. And that came from a manga series of, I think it was called Lone Wolf and Cub. That was oh, also okay. written by the guy who wrote Lady Snowblood. It shares a huh. lot of the same themes. And uh, I would argue that damnation is something that this particular writer likes to deal with because voluntary damnation in the quest of vengeance is pretty much how vengeance has to go. They always say, if you seek revenge, you should dig two graves. Games, right <laughs> yes <laughs> one for you and one for the witnesses that come along what? <laughs> one for you and one for the victim of the person yeah, you're seeking their revenge for oh, right oh Two yeah yeah that implies failure no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> no it's not that it implies failure man it implies that it's just going to keep happening yes yes i know <laughs> okay we get it yeah. Now, Lady Snowblood is there, the two films that we are going to be talking about. We're actually going to be doing Lady Snowblood 1 this week. Next week is Lady Snowblood 2 Song of Vengeance. And then the week after that. Now, I did not know this. Our man in the field, Robert, reported this to me. Bye. All right. Uh, apparently, the third film that we're going to be doing in this series of ladies getting covered in blood while holding samurai swords or various edged weaponry, mm -hmm. <laughs> this this trilogy, if you will, uh, the the Lady Snowblood films are, are clearly their 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 franchise, their series, they're together. That's what they're supposed to be. Now, wow. Sex and Fury was released the same time. That's the third film we're doing. The same time, apparently, as Lady Snowblood one, or at least the same year. And there's some derision on Sex and Fury and. There is some um, um, disparaging, mean, hurtful things that people say sometimes in and about Sex and Fury when dealing with Lady Snowblood. They take pot shots at Sex and Fury when talking Lady Snowblood. And I just want to state right now, right here, that's not going to happen on this show. <laughs> We're All not. Right. You're not taking pot shots. And also, I don't necessarily want to compare and contrast them, but they're all variations on a theme. So we will talk about the things that we liked and disliked from all of them. And if it ends up being a thing where we're like, I really like the way they did this certain type of death sequence stabbing versus this one, that's fine. But what I'm basically saying is to try and build up a film that is held in such high regard and is part of the Criterion Collection by punching down in your eyes to a film that is not as good, but is on of the same theme even though it was released the same year that's kind of horse shit right well kind of yeah if you're i mean just gonna constantly talk shit with without being constructive constructive <laughs> yeah well well i don't mean i don't mean constantly i don't mean like constantly bagging on it but like you compare two film films that they're your contemporaries it's fine to state a preference yeah that's cool. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example, right? American Werewolf in London mm -hmm. and The Howling were released the same year. I love both films very dearly. Yeah. I prefer The Howling because I saw it first and it resonates with me better. But when we did The Howling and I said that I liked it more, I didn't take pot shots at the one that I didn't like. And when I we were talking about all the Rick Baker effects and everything in American Werewolf in London, I was not trying to take pot shots at some things in The Howling. I just stated what I liked and disliked 
liked about each film upon their own merit. Okay. Ap- apples and oranges, man. You can't compare things like that, even though they're in yeah. the same same vein. And I know that I do that, and I know that I will pull stuff like that out. But what I'm basically saying is, if your review of a film is based on taking pot shots of another film, or does take pot shots at another film heavily, unless it's a film that very obviously stole from it, like a Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, what's the, what's the fucking point? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I get you. I get you. <laughs> You're not it, elevating your film by punching down in your own eyes, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Now, not, I get it. Do not get me wrong. I absolutely love Lady Snowblood. Uh-huh. Start to finish. It wouldn't be on this show if I didn't love it. Because <laughs> this is not a new buy for me. This is one that I've been itching to talk about. And I just feel like we finally got into the place where we're mature enough to talk about these kind of films. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love girls killing dudes with samurai swords. <laughs> I fucking okay, love well, it. Okay, well, listen, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one and was- who doesn't like when those dudes get sliced, an ungodly amount of blood shoots out like it's old faithful geyser. I think there's a serious blood pressure problem in her village. There I mean, it is real bad. <laughs> We should alert Everyone the, is real high strung. We should we should alert the Doctor Who's. Yes, right? All the Who's. <laughs> While we do that, let's take a break. All right. This'll keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting. But that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. I suppose I could have lied and said that I janked that right out of the film, and you may have actually believed me. It's possible, yeah. I, I might have. <laughs> <laughs> I tried my best to get it as a, authentic as I possibly could yeah. um, without actually janking stuff out of the film. <laughs> well, I mean, that makes sense. But, yeah. I mean, it's pretty close. Yeah, and as this is clearly a Japanese language film with subtitles, which we failed to mention at the beginning of the film, there will be yes. no credits, and the trailer is four or five odd minutes 
and Jesus. all That's requires and all requires subtitles, including the titles that pop up on the screen. So the trailer is not usable for our purposes. So let us sally forth all right. towards our review of Lady Snowblood. Lady Snowblood, the first 20 minutes. We begin in Tokyo. Uh, it's a Tokyo prison. It's the seventh year of the uh, uh, whatever era. The uh, Meiji? Uh, it, yeah, it's turn of the century Japan. Turn of the century, it's 1874, folks. Yeah, yeah, it's it's turn of the century Japan when they're starting to become more um, yeah, the, industrialized. The, yeah, the West is is making its way through. The European uh, is making its way through there. Well, and the uh, the Russians start contacting them at this point as well. Yeah. Uh, well, a woman is giving birth as the snow falls uh, out there, and everyone's very, very excited. She names the baby Yuki. Uh, she uh, says that she was born, this baby's born for vengeance. Um, and then we cut to a young lady, she's walking in the snow, and we see like this, two guys are carrying, uh, you know, got another guy, and they're all running up, and so she hides behind a wall, but they stop. Well, she comes out, and one of the guys goes to move her. Uh, apparently, this is a leader of a gang. And, uh, well, she cuts his arm. She cuts this guy's arms off, or one of his arms off. And then the other two guys, uh, one of the uh, gang leader, he's like, don't kill her. Take a prisoner and find out who sent her. Uh, they go. She cuts their throats very easily. And uh, then she uh, pretty much kills the gang leader uh, easily. And he asks who she is, and she says she is vengeance, and it leads right into her opening. So pretty uh, that's fucking a, badass intro. That's a hell of a way to start out uh, your fucking show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one thing that the creator of the manga apparently does really, really well, um, yeah. because it's very similar in the structure of the Lone Wolf and Cub films. There's almost always a bloodshed moment like this where your protagonist, who is definitely no hero, yeah. <laughs> lays waste to a plethora of fellow fighters in a very gruesome and bloody way. <laughs> it, nothing's wrong with that, though. I and, mean, no, and from what I hear, that is directly from the manga. That that is a, the influence is coming directly from that. Nice, that's cool. Uh, so we then start off, and it's over twenty years later. Uh, the European ideals of progress have become widely accepted in the country. Um, however, there are still pretty much it's the same as it always is. There's a bunch of rich assholes and uh, uh bad people who are carving out territory from themselves and taking it from the poor and less fortunate. So, the same story, different time. Um, more things in- change, the more they stay the same. Exactly. Um, they mention, the narrator mentions, a woman of the netherworld. She is beautiful, but pretty much she's just a badass and built only for vengeance. Um, uh, she then, she walks in, and we can tell it's, 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 it's Yuki. She walks into a village and says she's looking for this lord. Lord, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. <laughs> Probably for um, the best. Yeah. Uh, uh, real crazy and creepy dude says, yeah, I'll show you. And then a group, he and a group of guys take her out into the field and they are going to rape her and kill her. Before she brings out her sword and starts swiggity swacking all these motherfuckers into fucking just cuts of meat, uh, an old man stops him. And he says, you know, calls them idiots and says that this um, is the woman who killed the ruthless Genzo who would bankrupt their village pretty much. So uh, as uh, she meets with him, uh, he uh, she asks her to help him find three men who are well, three people who uh, live, or at least were, from the same place that this lord was from. Um, She mentions that during uh, the uh, blood tax riots in the sixth year of Miji, the three ran an anti-draft scam, robbing an entire village of their money. Um, uh, The man says he remembers such a scam. The lord said he remembers the scam, but he remembers that there were four of them. And she says, well, it's three. Uh, One of them's already dead. Uh, so the Lord says, because of all she's already done for him, he will look for her and try to find it. Uh, so then we flash back, uh, and we get, like, an announcement from another narrator that men have to register for the draft, that there's a great war coming, um, and that the poor, more unfortunate folks, they didn't really agree to these drafts and, and didn't want them. Um, then it was a rumor being put around countryside that men in white were said to be 
pawns of the government and would collect blood of your average person and sell it to foreign native or uh, to foreign nations. A lot of this is also drawn. Like you actually see it yes. as though it's a uh, very work yeah, yeah. of the time that would tell you the tale of like yeah. an image or two. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much something that you would see nowadays happen. I'm just saying, you know, a lot of stuff nowadays kind of goes like this. So it's a very... It's Ken Burns style documentary is what you're getting yeah. at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, really cool, I think. Yeah, they um, do it They do it rather well. And I love the way that they use this traditional art that's similar to seeing woodcuts about vampires terrorizing small villages in a hammer felt. It's the yeah, same yeah, kind yeah. of thing. It gives you a sort of cultural immersive experience while it's telling you very pertinent information that is expository dialogue. It does it in a way that keeps you from being too Board. this would have been a clip yeah yeah it's 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 pretty well done and all of the artwork keeps you entertained while they're filling your head with all this backstory yeah they're, yeah. they're quite good at it to, totes my goats all right so uh we then see a family they're walking through kind of just the this valley it's a husband and the husband of this family a, a, a son uh, a mother or son wife and uh, husband, he's wearing a white suit. Well, we start hearing these bell ringing, and the wife is calling for her son to come back, but all of this villagers and these people come up, and a lady grabs the son. Well, um, the uh, a bunch of them surround him, saying it's a man in white, it's a man in white, and he uh, tells them that he's actually just the new teacher of the village. Well, uh, they don't believe him, and a man slices him, blood pours out everywhere. We see that man's name is Gish Shuro. Uh, we see another man stab him, and he's uh, Benzo. Uh, another man, Tukushi, also stabs him, uh, and he falls dead, while the lady holds the wife hostage with a knife. And they just completely massacre this dude, killing him. His wife gets away and, and cries over his body, and that pretty much ends that first 20 minutes. Holy fuck. That's that's a, that's a early 20 minutes. That's a 20 minutes to start out with. Down to damn near the look and film grain that this Blu-ray transfer has, this opening reveals the entirety of the structure for Kill Bill that yeah. that Quentin Tarantino used. It is mm -hmm. near impossible to argue that he did not take the structure and, of the editing from this intro and the way it jumps around in the chapter markers. Yeah. It's and impossible I've, to argue that he didn't. I, I, I can't go off too much. I've only seen bits and pieces of Kill Bill. <laughs> I've never seen it full on through, so. Oh, no, that's not true. You did watch Lady Snowblood. Oh, okay, I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> this film is gorgeously shot. The compositions are just unbelievable. I can't even yeah. I can't even begin to just describe certain shots and frames that stand out in my mind because I am just so awash with watching it from that, last night that like with, every single frame of this film is masterfully composed, man. Like they really took their time and staged stuff out, particularly in the battles. This is such a really well-made film. I mean, I got to say, man, it's I, I, you, it looks like a modern day movie. It really does. It has a modern day movie feel. Not something that was made. I don't know when was this released. I I, I don't even know. It's that like seventy three or seventy four. Yeah, it, do, it does not feel like that. Yeah, it's at all. Fucking ridiculous! How yeah. good this film looks now. I know it, it must have been restored looks, and shit. But yeah. I, but I mean, it seventy three. It was released in seventy three. It feels like a movie that could have been released. Uh, a, a month ago. Well, we'll go into the next 20 minutes then. So far, this has been a rip-roaring of a time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's about to get real dark real fast and never let off that accelerator to yep. dark and terrible, yeah, terrible, terrible a, things. It's a really bad stuff. <laughs> let's move. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Let, let's get to that stuff. <laughs> so uh, we come back to the modern time. We see Yuki. We hear her thanking this reverend for all his training. He tells her to forget everything, any emotion, the only thing that she should ever feel is vengeance. We see her kneeling at two graves, one of a uh, Soyo uh, Kajima and a, Tor, uh, a Tora Kobayashi. Um, uh, and then uh, we hear the reverend say, you are the child of the Neverworld. Uh, be so evil that Buddha cannot even save your soul. Um, so uh, we then go back in time again. We're back at the prison and we're during the birthing process. Um, Seo's having a very difficult birth. Uh, the baby is all twisted around. She's way overdue. Um, and we get another flashback. 
We now were back to the time where her husband was murdered. We see her son lays on a bridge, dead, and the three men take her into a barn and they rape her as the lady watches and laughs. And so, also directs and encourages and tells them yeah. what to do like it's fucking Mother's Day all over again. Yeah, it's um, it's some gross ass shit. We go back to the prison and the baby is born. The ladies ask why this was done to her. Um, and like why, like such violence was put upon her. Uh, she tells them that the four uh, were, that the four of these people were in the village, and they swindled the village out of uh, all their cash and everything uh, for, in that draft uh, con. And it turns out Tukuichi wanted her body, so he took her, after spending days raping her, to Tokyo and opened up a restaurant. She is his wife. Uh, well, she said she bided her time, and that bided her time means when he was having sex on with her, or, you know, raping her. Uh, she killed him by stabbing him in the back, then the chest. Then, as she was hunting down the other three, she was arrested and put in jail for life. Uh, then she said the reason she wanted to get pregnant, and so she had sex with as many girls. As as it took, she wanted to have a strong, healthy boy. That's what she said. It's important to carry on the vengeance. It's important to note that she talks about having seriously laid down with any man that yeah. came within grasp of her in the uh -huh. hopes of getting pregnant. So yeah. much so that the other women in the prison looked down on her, called her names, and were basically just rather abrasive towards her. And she didn't care because no. nobody nobody tried to do anything to her. They just basically degraded her verbally and. And she did not care at all because she was literally doing this very quest. Yeah. She was trying to create a baby out of sheer spite and hate. Yeah. And when she was successful, she creates this child that she gives birth to that pretty much kills her only yes. she only lives long enough to tell the story of her her hatred and why this child has been made and she even declares to the child that it is an azura demon she, yeah okay literally she makes this child a spirit of vengeance for her and that's its only purpose for existing and that is so unfair to this little child this baby Very girl unfair. does not deserve yeah. this does not yeah, I just want to point that out. That's how dark and fucking twisted this movie got. Yeah, Her hatred was so powerful. Deep. She had to turn it into a baby and yeah. have it be raised to complete her vengeance quest. Yeah. Pretty much. And she tells one of the ladies helping to give birth to take care of the baby and to raise her to, you know, destroy her enemies. Well, sometime later, uh, one of the women, uh, she's the, that woman who's going to raise her is um, released from prison. Um, and she takes the baby with her and raises her with Reverend Dokai, who's. Oh, so I didn't know what his heels. He was a reverend. He, he's a reverend, and he also was something else. He's a warrior priest. The easiest way to look priest, at him is he is a okay. warrior priest. Let's just go D and D with this. Yeah, all right, warrior priest. There you go. Spiritual ass kicker, right? <laughs> He kicks He's, ass or whatever deity he believeth in. All right. So um, they uh, then cut to Yuku, and she's eight years old, and uh, it's training time. He puts her in a barrel and says, no matter what, keep yourself inside at all times. They roll it down. It hits a rock. She gets thrown out. And the reverend keeps telling her, you got to get up. You got to get up. You got to get up. Then they have a dual practice with, like, some sticks. She gets her ass kicked. Then they do sword practice, and he cuts her clothes off, and then it gets a little weird. This is not training. This is child abuse. Yeah. He is purposely uh, tormenting her and causing her emotional distress to force her to try to defend herself to make this emotional stress end. Yeah. And when it won't end and he continues to humiliate her and defeat her, force her to try even harder. He's filling this girl with all of the hate that was in her mother, but directing it into this training to make her work even harder. Like yeah. th this is demented and just so fucking psycho. It is bad. <laughs> it's it's real bad, folks. <laughs> like when you really, really think about like the level of hatred, because it's all heaped on someone before they're even born, and th this is like Hatfield and McCoy's level of grudge, dude. I'm yeah, impressed. Yeah. Like I, oh, I, man. I strive for this level of fucking grudge. Like I, there's no way I can do it. Like I suppose, it's outrageous. Though, to if me. the love of your life was butchered in front of you, then your child was also butchered in front of you. Then you were violated for. Uh, three days and three nights, uh, you might have vengeance on your mind a lot. And I'm then taken by somebody forced to be their spouse. 
I'm not saying really it's, kidnap victim. I'm not saying it's not justified. I'm just saying it's wrong to it's, be heaped upon this little girl. Well, okay, <laughs> that that is very true. That shouldn't shouldn't be happening. She has every right to be that angry, and the yeah. the the fact that all of this pressure is leaped like just heaped all onto this little girl right at the moment of her birth as a baby. Even spiritually speaking, like this is a path of damnation. Her mother has told her she has to go on to have yeah. this quest. Like she, they literally talk about how she's part of the underworld, where she is the crimson snow of the underworld as a lady, uh-huh. and they 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 have these long diatribes about this stuff. They are heavily coding it in very artful language but the translation is this little girl's soul was sold to whatever darkness is out there to facilitate the mother's vengeance and she now walks that path for however long this darkness chooses to make her that's what's going on like her mother sold her soul to this power whatever this is and they're saying it they're not showing it directly they're just showing you the effects of it and maybe it's a way to explain all of the supernatural fucking badassery that this woman is capable of Uh sure I'm fine with that that's totally fucking cool but this is a Faust story pretty much yeah <laughs> this is a damnation like sold soul for vengeance of a There's descendant no happy ending here yeah this There's- is this is sacrificing your second born child yeah for revenge like that's that's the part that i'm getting at is like that's the dark part that i'm like wow that's intense that's a lot of hate because some that, people yeah. would tend to stop there i would argue just to purposely you purposely made another life to destroy three other lives. Right. Like that level of hatred. Like that's that's a point where I'm sure many people would not cross, Matt. I don't think it's weird to say that's extreme. That, no, it's probably not weird. I just want to, <laughs> you know, I just want to put in perspective what this other person went through to get to that level. I'm not saying it's not justified. I'm just saying the horrible part is that it's all heaped upon this child. And I'm looking at it from the point of a child who has had baggage from his parents heaped upon him. Oh, okay. You get what See, I'm I, saying? I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, all right, how about that? I think we're, we're saying the same thing. I just misunderstood you. We're, we're, it's bad this is heaped upon a child, but it's understandable the amount of hate she has. I just feel like that's a line that she crossed to damn both of them. Yes. Right. I mean, she did. <laughs> but she she's definitely had a lot of help getting there. Yeah, well, yeah, totally. And it, I, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate on anything here. It's just uh, yeah. like, I really literally how felt about this? horrible. We just say for... a lot of terrible shit happened. I just feel horrible for Yuki the entire time. Like, it, yeah, if, Yuki is the seriously besides the husband and son that were murdered. Yuki's the other only real victim in all this, and you feel the somewhat reluctance and sadness of what she has to do. And I think that's what bugs me too. At least at yeah. first, and then at some point, um, the demon part of her does take over. I would say, and when we mm-hmm. get there, we'll talk about it. But I just this is all stuff that we had to deal with, and we didn't deal with it in the twenty minutes because we didn't really know where we were going until now, and we have yeah. to talk about it now. So. Uh, uh, when the next 20 minutes goes, we'll roll through because we spent a lot of time talking about it now. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Okay. So, um, all right. All the practice is over. At one point, she's in the barrel. He actually tries to chop the barrel. And that's when she does like 16 flippy flips. So she's fucking ready. Uh, we cut back to the present day and she leaves the graves. And we cut to chapter two. Crying, uh, uh, crying bamboo dolls of the netherworld. I didn't even see a chapter one listed. I do not remember if I know, a chapter I know, I one. checked. There, I don't think there was a chapter one at all. Unless I completely fucking missed it. But I even went back to check once the chapter two thing came up. I was like, huh, I must have missed it. I didn't miss it. <laughs> I, be- I, still- I, 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 it's not that I don't believe you. I feel yeah. like, um, maybe the way that they set it up with the, uh, subtitles, uh-huh. maybe it was a, a chapter two, maybe actually is the next part of the saga and the way that it's translated is chapter two for us but in the way that it's done in that language there's no need to say the first one is the first chapter and give you a title because it's the overture it's the the, the beginning the intro to the story yeah and now we're I mean, in the actual true. start of the story i guess yeah so i mean that that could all be very well yeah. <laughs> right like chapter one may not need to be declared with a title but chapter two from here on out must be yeah maybe. something you know who knows what the hell's going on yeah but i'm just uh, trying to explain it yeah uh, a few days later we find out that banzo has been found we see that banzo's a very sick old man his daughter um 
it goes to sell their, her bamboo dolls. Uh, she tells them they sell very well. When she leaves, she just throws them all in the ocean. Uh, she sees Yuki saying they're staring at her, watching her throw them in, and she says, well, they don't sell anyway. And she gives her this little stick. I, I don't know what that was. It looked like yeah. a. It looked like it might have been a dessert, like a cake pop treat or something. Maybe. <laughs> Something like that. She yeah. said she made it herself. It looked like all wood to me, so I'm not I'm not exactly sure uh, when any of that was. But. Maybe it was a spoon or something. I don't know, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I couldn't really tell either. I thought it was like some kind of cake pop, but then again, I've just been craving that stuff. <laughs> it's just like, I just want a cake pop, man. <laughs> so anyway, um, so uh, at that point, um, Yuki asks her name, and she tells her her name, and of course, Yuki recognizes her last name. She has a shocked look. Uh, then we cut to the daughter. What the daughter actually does for money is she sells herself for the money. But like she's like a high-end escort, I guess you would say. Um, yeah, this is a classy joint that she is yeah. going to. It is a Yakuza-run establishment that pays all the protection to the police to be left alone and they do their own security it, it's it's serious it's not fucking around like this is this is the place that the discerning gentleman would go for you know that kind of light entertainment yeah <laughs> and could feel safe so long as his money was good and he didn't you know fucking hurt anybody that he shouldn't have yeah exactly so um then we see two guys come over and they're kind of two assholes and they come over and they taunt bonzo and tell him of what his daughter does and he flips out and that ends that 20 minutes yeah let's just keep rolling we talked about all the ah. pertinent stuff we needed to it just happened organically yep so we come down to a betting game and we see that yuki is the dealer actually in this game uh bon the uh, benzo uh he shows up and he's playing and he starts cheating a bit and he is caught and he's outside the throwing knives at him he is such a little bitch that he even if to be let go, he offers his daughter to them. Yeah, that was what fucking a, gross. He's a piece of yeah, shit. Yes. Well, uh, Yuki comes out and she actually asks um, before he's killed if she can take him. She, she's like, I should recognize this. Let me, you know, let me spare him. And they all kind of say, fine. They agree. A big boss agrees. She um, basically shoulders the blame, saying that as the dealer, she should have recognized that he was cheating. It's yeah. on her. She should pay for this. And, you know, please yeah. don't kill him. That kind of thing. Yeah, pretty much. She gets him out. And as she's leaving, she runs into his daughter. She tells her that if anything happens, she should go to Tokyo and meet such and such a person. And that person will help her. And the daughter says she can never leave her dad. And so Yuki just leaves. Well, she talks to him at a restaurant, and he thanks her, but she says, yeah, it's it's, it's time for your road to death, big, big shoots. It's, it's time to go. Um, and she takes him to, like, the beach and talks, and she gives him the lowdown about who she is, what they're doing, and, and what's getting ready to happen. And he freaks, bang, does everything. First, he denies ever knowing. Then he says those other people, they dragged him into it. They're the real people who caused this problem. He didn't even, you know, it, it's all their fault. He didn't want anything to do with it. I'm then flashing back to the I spit on your grave and Matthew, the character of Matthew and everything oh, yeah. that he says right after, you know, she comes back for vengeance because it's almost the exact same stuff. Yeah, pretty much. It, it's um, the trying to beg out of what's happening. Yeah. So then finally he just starts begging, begging, um, and she says, fuck you off, and she kills him and then tosses his body into the sea. Bye, bitch. <laughs> so she she does that with great care, and it takes her a while to drag his fucking huge corpse across the ground and you see his face dragging for quite a while and it's pretty graphic in the way that they're doing it like yeah. his face doesn't get torn up a bunch of shit and shit but like the actor or the body dummy that they made if the dummy looked that great it looked like the actor's face yeah like it was serious dedication and that did not look comfortable for anybody she no. did not look happy having to drag that man it clearly was a lot of work for her <laughs> it, yes it was and I sincerely um, hope it was a dummy that got thrown off the cliff <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it was. I, I hope so, yeah. So, so then we go into chapter three, Umbrella of Blood, Heart of Strewn Flowers. We see Yuki staring at a grave, really pissed off, and we see it's Gishiro's grave, which means she's not getting to kill him. Something already has. She cuts the flowers and defaces the stone and leaves. As Breaking her sword in the process, uh, in her yeah. rage, she snaps her sword. Yeah. Against I the mean, stone, but she leaves a pretty good fucking chip out of the stone from that thin yeah. little needle of a blade she has. Oh yeah, she she lets the world know that 
this was horse shit. <laughs> so the rage that is contained in this tiny little package is intense. It, yeah, it's fucking brutal. And uh, we see another dude walks up and watches her leave. And then he kind of walks over and sees the grave site. And he looks concerned, but not surprised. But it's important but, to note that the guy was at that specific grave of a yeah. an enemy of hers. Then we see she sits in sadness in a bar with that lord who helped her find people. People, and I believe the woman who helped raise her sitting in there. Uh, there is sadness that she did not get to kill him. He apparently had died three years ago on a ship dealing opium to foreigners. Uh, they uh, Then they start automatically looking for the lady, the last living person of which her vengeance is needed. As Yuki walks down the street, the dude from the grave comes to talk to her. He's apparently a reporter and author. He says he looks for the truth all the time. And she pretty much says, after kind of discussing with her, she says, You really want to leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you, and I'll kill you if you come near me. And she leaves, and that ends that 20 minutes. Not a lot happening in this 20 minutes. A lot of it's just still great cinematography. A, a little bit of stories being thrown in here. I don't think there's much to add. Uh, I just want to stress once again, it's an important plot point that I think a lot of people tend to overlook. But she goes to deface the grave of an enemy. The man confronts her there or con- sees her as she's doing it and then kind of speaks with her later and starts yeah. talking with her and asking her questions. It's the same man and he turns out to be a reporter. But it's yeah. in- it's important to stress that the only time he noticed her or the only reason that he did notice her is because yeah. of those actions at the grave. Yes. All and right. I will say that this one last time because I want to point that out and it's also the time that she allows herself to lose control and have yes. her anger take over. Instead of vengeance it's anger has, has, has taken over. Right. She's allowing the disappointment and you know the blue balls in her killing hand if you will <laughs> is upsetting her so greatly that she loses her temper and she exposes herself thusly by doing it. Yes. This is a pattern with this character that we'll see happen later on, I would submit to you. All right. She so. kind of loses her cool because she's so gung-ho for vengeance that yeah. sometimes she kind of overplays her hand and that's where she ends up getting herself hurt or exposed. Right. Yes, she can do that. Maybe she'll go head rushing into situations, but I guess when you're built for nothing but vengeance your entire life, that's, that's going to happen. Well, it's not a calculated vengeance. It's rage is what yeah. it is. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. All right. So... We start the next 20 minutes with uh, the guy writes about, and he calls her the snow lady. And he's kind of writing out about her story and about her vengeance. We come to find out the reverend himself was the one who told the reporter about her. And it's to help uh, that he believes the more he writes, the more the story gets out, that's going to draw out the lady that they're all looking for. Then we cut to, we see Benzo's daughter uh, is actually with the reporter crying, asking if this story is true. He says uh, that it is, and she gets angry, saying that she killed his father. Um, uh, The reporter tries to tell her he knows how she feels, but she won't listen. And then all of a sudden, the police come in. She leaves, and the police stop him from chasing after her. They says that uh, they're going to take him to headquarters to question him about the story because it's causing too much problem out on the streets. Um, so... Yeah, I guess you fucker. Um, okay, to the police state. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I think what they're getting at is the uh, poor are really getting behind this story of vengeance that happened to her, and some yeah. of the people that are being named are actual criminals that are being named in the story. So mm-hmm. he is dramatizing the truth. It's like a precursor to the way the Korean news is, where you always see like those like CG things with the music and dancing that they do. Yeah. You know, those kind of like weird, like meme clips they make of yeah. that stuff. Uh, but it, it's it's sort of like that where like he's telling the tales and he's dramatizing it or like those old West newspapers that were about like the famous gunman of the West. You know, he's yes. doing something similar to that. But the thing is, is he's naming real people who are still alive and are criminals and are in power. And there are people who pay off the police that are part of this. So, of course, they're going to come for him. Yeah. Um, he knows this. He's doing this shit on purpose. And we will find out later that it's even more fucking ballsy and just what the fuck, dude. Yeah, pretty much. We're yeah, going to find that out later. Yes, we are. 
Um, so anyway, um, the daughter then of the guy who was killed earlier, she actually tells Yuki's people about what happened. Then the, the mother, the woman who raised Yuki asks if she wants to like to see Yuki and she says she has nothing to say to her and leaves. Well, the cops are torturing the reporter, beating the shit out of everything. And who should come out but that lady? Apparently she runs with this group and, uh, she's used her money to build this little hideaway, this hideout and stuff. And they decide they're going to use this guy as bait to draw out Yuki. Well, the guys come outside after hearing something. Sure enough, there's Yuki up there. She jumps down, and in this kind of, you know, rage stuff, she actually gets cut on her arm. And then, that almost like, it's almost like the pain settles her down a little bit. Well, because- she realized she made a mistake. She was cut, and yeah. that was a reminder, and then her training kicks in. Yes, when she's- because it seems like after every mistake, she realizes it and goes to make it not happen anymore. Right, she's learning from her mistakes like a true warrior, like or samurai should. You know, I yeah. I just want to state I know shit about that culture other than what I've seen and been shown in films. So uh-huh. I'm just trying to use the vernacular of how I get this. Like she's learning to fight better. So yes. if that means she's becoming a better samurai because that's what she should be considered great or ninja or assassin or whatever, she's becoming a more efficient killer. She's learning from her mistakes in battling multiple opponents with sword play. That's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, she, um, she then cuts down a few guys, fucks them up pretty good. Um, this is and- where the very pressurized blood spray yes. starts happening to the point where I'm concerned about the epidemic of blood pressure in these villages. Yeah, it's going to be bad. <laughs> it literally sprays everywhere. Yeah, it's all over the place. She gets inside, and we see the lady's got the reporter there, and she's shooting. She has a light on, so she can, or a candle lit, so she can see whenever Yuki tries to come after her. As she keeps shooting a gun at Yuki, the reporter actually uses his body and douses out the flame. Then Yuki's able to get up there in darkness and cut the lady, but she falls and gets surrounded by her men. She gets up and runs, but Yuki throws down like a sand bomb down there, like a sand grenade, and then starts cutting all them up, killing them all they her and the reporter go looking they find the lady she has hung herself and so yuki just cuts her at the waist cuts her in half that's a fucking awesome sound of guts falling to the floor and that ends that 20 minutes blood sprays from so many wounds in so many different directions our main actress is getting ash from evil dead coated at certain points and it is the sexiest goddamn thing i had ever seen at the moment I saw this before I saw the other films we're talking about. Let me just state that here. All right. But I was really into the blood spraying all over this actress. I really dug it. I dug it. It was it was an awakening for me where I realized that watching ladies cut dudes into shreds is a thing I'm into. I probably could have told you that. Actually. That's also that's also a clip, by the way. <laughs> probably, yeah. Well, we start now. I want to. I want to. I just want to preface that hey, I know I made that a clip because I I want that as a clip. You want that as a clip. You need it as a clip. I think the world <laughs> needs it as a clip. Matt. Uh, That's true. But the important point is, I also want to point out that I'm talking about in a the context of a false story or a narrative story that I know is not based on actual facts. <laughs> I don't want to watch <laughs> someone get carved up for real. I just like it. Not in a for movie. real, real, just for play, play. Yeah, for play, play. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way to phrase it. Yeah. All right. So now we go into the final 20 minutes. And this is when shit really starts jumping off. So Yuki and the reporter talk and her quest for vengeance is over she questions herself if she can live a normal life or actually it's a reporter questioning it if she can live a normal life now that vengeance her vengeance is over vengeance is no longer a part of her life because everyone's dead he's also very clearly in love with her and this is is definitely in love with her this is a shoehorned nauseating love story and i think she cares she cares about him a little bit as well because she's helping banging to jump up yeah this isn't she just wouldn't care Again, this is an annoying shoehorned love story to me. Kind of. Anyway. I know that this makes it a more well-rounded fairy tale esque type story for everyone that likes that sort of thing. But let's make with the bloodshed, man. Well, it, luckily, this love story part doesn't last too long. No, so, you're absolutely right. I just, I it, it, it killed the momentum for me. And now, you know what, now though? My... It, it helps explain the end. Yeah, because but if it, he didn't love her, he wouldn't do what he did at the end. Yeah, I, I get it, Matt. It's just that it's destroying my bloodshed boner, okay? All right, all right. Don't worry. It's about to come back. <laughs> if your bloodshed boner lasts more than four hours, see a doctor. 
<laughs> or just stop watching John Woo films. <laughs> That's, that could be close, too. All right, he begins writing again, and he's writing her chapter four, but before he can come up with the title, a man comes in. The reporter says he kind of accuses the man of being Jishiro and saying that he wasn't dead after all, he's alive. The man says that that, ma- that person we mentioned was a nothing and died three years ago. The reporter says he knows that he faked his death to avoid the police because of his opium sales. Well, this man tells the reporter that he now supplies weapons to the government. He's pretty much untouchable, and they're going to be probably at war soon. He So he's really needed. He says he lives in this mansion where it's supposed to be like this, like, um, where free thoughts are put into motion and people are able to discuss, like, different cultures. But really, it's just a place for the rich and influential to indulge themselves in whatever they're looking to indulge themselves in. It's a pleasure palace for, you know, fucking and demented, really stuff that I'm jealous that I don't get to participate in, it looks like. Pretty much. Uh, He tells the the reporter now to stop writing his story that everything is over nothing and, and, and it's really weird why would he care if anybody kept writing the story he could have stayed hidden forever and no one would have known i mean you'll it find just out seems weird you that f- he came out of hiding <laughs> you'll find out why so anyway um he uh so he tells the reporter that uh you know you should just stop writing the story he asks if this is a threat are you threatening me and he says some things never change he goes listen just stay away stay out don't ever come back he leaves well yuki shows up and the reporter tells her everything that just happened and then drops another bomb this man gishiro is the reporter's father that is why because his son is doing this shit and even though he acts like he doesn't care about his son he's coming to warn his son that bad things things will happen and he's going to have to kill his son if they don't keep te- if he doesn't stop telling this tale i think also the son was going to keep working on trying to find him because the son never believed that his father was dead right he's saying so the story also explains he's literally yeah. saying stop looking for me yes i yeah. exist the story ends here i'm warning you or something bad will happen and yeah. he's saying that to his own son he came to threaten his own son saying don't think that just because you're my kid you yeah. get to live by doing this you don't yeah. And he's well, telling like, him to stop. Like, a that's man like why. that doesn't care about his kid. So. No, no. He's coming back to threaten him because he doesn't want him to keep going. Yeah. But the fact that he is the man that she has been looking for, he tells her that he's the father. So he's coming back and he, I think he still does love his kid because otherwise he would just have him killed. True. I Yeah. There must be some kind of caring in there. Because. So you're right about that. He could easily have him killed for something else. Yeah, I mean, this man is pretty much untouchable. Yeah, and he could have him, he could easily have him killed for, like, any other excuse. He could have just had the police do it and have them say it was a robbery, that someone broke into his his home or something, you know? They could have totally covered it up and made it be a thing. But he did this specifically to give his son one last chance. And the son pretty much takes it, but also begins to just give Yuki the help she needs to get her revenge. Because yeah. that's how much this dude has daddy issues. And I thought I had them, but this kid's got them so much worse. This, is, this kid's got a really, it's going to be a bad time. Uh, so he takes Yuki to the mansion. It is a uh, masquerade ball. So, you know, everyone's uh, supposed to like, you know, hey, we're all hidden. Woohoo, look at all of us. So anyway. uh <laughs> <laughs> it's also uh, about the matching of the frilly mask to the outfit. Yeah. It's trying to make yourself look as hot as possible while still wearing a tiny mask that maybe well, enhances your alluring, you know, she, capabilities. She sees the man and he gets up, he sees her and he walks into a room. So she tracks him to that room. And this is where her anger blinds her because she walks in not very carefully. And he is standing right behind the door and slices at her. Um, She uh, barely gets nicked, but they kind of fight around. She gets her sword from out of her back where she was hiding it. They fight. She cuts off his hands pretty easily, then cuts him down again. The reporter comes in and stops her from freaking mangling him and looks down and he sees that his beard comes off. And then we see it's a full mask. There's somebody pretending to be him. The reporter. That's How much around, money did you have to pay that guy to do this? I mean, oh, that or it was either you could die quick by her hand or you can die slow by mine. That is fair as well. And also, if you kill her, then whatever made yeah. me want you to have to have this assignment, we're clear. Yeah, you're dead yeah, as we're paid. Clear. Yeah. Yeah. 
And and if you do die, I'll take care of your family. Some poor <laughs> shit like that. Oh, not you know? necessarily I'll take care of your family, but then your debt is now paid with your death. Yeah, yeah. So I won't go looking for anybody who, you know, I can maybe try to get all that money from. Or whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, the, the reporter, then he's staring at these mirror walls and he like, he knows his father. So he brings up and he breaks one of the mirrors and there's the secret passage and you see his father standing there and he runs off. Uh, the reporter grabs a sword. They both give chase, but there's two exits the father could have gone that lead to two different balconies in the ballroom. They both, you know, they each take one and she comes out and she he's not out there and then they see she sees that the son and the father bust out into the other balcony they are fighting one another he pulls out a gun and the reporter knowing how important this is to her he bum rushes the father who keeps shooting him but he's still bum rushing him almost holding him as he dies and goes dead weight did that not look like a shoot six shooter pistol to you it was definitely a six shooter pistol. This motherfucker fires like nine shots at least. I counted them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he can. He, he had a, he had a lot going for him there, and never uh, reloaded. I just want to point that out. Yeah. Well, that means movie magic. Um. So he the sun up against him. She hops over, drives her sword into the back of the dead sun. It goes all the way through, killing uh the uh. Uh, killing the father and completing her vengeance fucking run. At this point, she kind of just is walking outside. The fucking party's going crazy because they all see this death, blood everywhere. Um, she goes outside and, uh, as she's walking, all of a sudden we see Benzo's daughter rushes up on her and stabs her in the stomach. She stumbles a bit around outside as the daughter runs away. She falls down to the ground and apparently dies. Or what looks like to be death. Uh, this uh, it's as night turns to day. It gets in the morning. We see her hand clinch into some snow. Her eyes open. Let's roll some credits. So are you happy to know that we will be doing the next Lady Snowblood film? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if it's like this, yeah. I'm interested to see what she's, where, she, where does she go from here? If she's alive, where, where, where the fuck do we go? She's done with vengeance on like her, for her mother's part. What, what What's next? <laughs> Initially when I had said ages and ages ago that the films coming up once March Mate was over, we were going to be featuring a genre of film that we had never covered before. Uh-huh. I was referring to Lady Snowblood. Lady Snowblood, a uh, song for vengeance, I believe is the second one, but the Lady Snowblood too, and then Sex and Fury. I was referring to these films, these three, because nice. other than Ninja Wars, which was like, I think episode one, which was more or less a horror film because it was like samurais versus fucking demons from hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with like black magic and stuff so like i mean it had samurai elements in it but i i always considered that a horror film it just happened to be set in a like feudal japan you know yeah this is like the closest to the full-fledged what i consider samurai films you know? i would agree i would definitely agree yeah I samurai mean, films always have like a form of vengeance in it and then sword play and at least the ones that you and i have been exposed to i can't speak for every single one but at least the ones that we are familiar with they have that vengeance or something that drives the character on this quest of death Yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I just the the cinematography for this film is so fucking gorgeous. Every single frame is something to behold. The yeah. textures of the fabric look incredible. And I'm not just saying that because I finally got my, you know, giant screen set up with my 4K projector and it just looked incredible. <laughs> I'm not just saying it because of that, although that is absolutely true. Um I watched the- it on a computer screen and the fucking movie is beautiful. I, the more of the frame said, I, that I, you can actually more, see, like, and be absorbing yeah. around you, the more of the textures of the fabrics and the the wood grains and things like that come out, and like it's very clearly stylized down to every detail of the set, and it's so yeah. gorgeously produced. I, it makes me hungry for more of this type of cinema, and I'm so glad I, we have two more weeks of it, dude. Like I said, this movie could have been if you'd have told me uh, it's more of a rip version of a movie that came out last year i'd have believed it because it looks like something like that yeah it you know looks, well, it's like, oh yeah i mean it, it's grainy and stuff because you, you could be like because it's it's ripped and not not from a a, a reputable source but you know it's, <laughs> it's it was made a year ago i'd be like okay i i, I think that 
Listen, I mean, just because it's a nefarious acquisition does not mean the source is not reputable. All right, all right, settle it down. You know what I mean. <laughs> I just like to use the words nefarious acquisition. Yes, that, that is that is a fun word to say. Nefarious <laughs> acquisitions. Acquisitions. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I, I we kind of went into all of the details um, about my feelings as we were kind of exposing the bits of the story because that's how this film does it. Does it rips those responses out of you? It drives those feelings forward, and it does not let up with any of this. Like just when you. F- feel relatively comfortable with seeing her on her vengeance quest. We then see that she will be denied this vengeance and we have seen this rage that has no place to go. And it's almost like a form of grief because they always say that grief is just love with no place to go. You know, it's, it's like you, you have all this love for this person and that since they're no longer there, that's what your grief is, you know, is just this, this love that's just being backed up. <laughs> You know, that you you have no way of expressing and and it just creates this longing. Well, this rage that she has is kind of similar to that. Like these moments where she just loses herself. It's like this fueling rage that she has that, that keeps her focused and keeps her driving forward. At certain points, it doesn't have a place to go because these people are gone. She can't get vengeance and it boils over in those moments. And then when she's there, she gets a little hot headed and charges headlong without fear of what may happen to her life even though like she is extraordinarily lucky at the same time it's it's interesting the way that the film lays out the story and how things kind of progress and you watch her become a better machine of vengeance and this is totally it feels like an origin story and i can't wait to watch <laughs> lady snowblood 2 next week and really kind of dig into that one as well i'm excited yeah i'm really i'm really yeah i'm 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 totally like pumped for this for this next week so uh, this is a great movie to watch this is a great palate cleanser after may or march (laughs) mate yeah the other two movies were really bizarre and just all over the place and weird and just kind of like our norm and that's not what we needed we needed something like this we yeah we need some real good (laughs) <laughs> this is the sorbet for Matt's palate before yes. we, we move forward into the full franchise fest to close out the show. That's right. <laughs> hey, speaking of closing out shows, why don't we take the break so we can do the PSYOP news? All right, man. Are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery? Is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world? To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a weekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather.
Oh, man, I was getting kind of mesmerized by that. <laughs> in no way, shape, or form was that playing for an extended period of time to pad out the runtime of the episode for our dear listeners. There's no way that I would I would do that at all. She just told me we'd have played Yokozuna's theme song. Wow, that's kind of offensive, I think. No, it's fucking rad. Fucking Yokozuna's theme song was great. Although it would be cultural appropriation because the, the man who was Yokozuna was actually Samoan and uh, not a Japanese sumo wrestler as he was booked. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know, we're if, ba- I don't know if that f- shit would fly today. Yeah, we're back to full circle, not cool, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, that no, that would be cool. You know, I just didn't think about it until now that Yokozuna wasn't actually Japanese sumo wrestler, but was a Samoan. Twenty twenty one hindsight is such a bitch, isn't it? It's, it? It really it, like shit. You think you're like, wow, that's a gimmick that would not go over well today. <laughs> that would not go well. Well, let's try a gimmick that goes over well for us and give me some psyop news. from pete uh that would be uh, our man pete from good beer bad movie night unless it's a different pete in which case uh that's the only pete i can think of with a podcast can you just say his last name to you and you'll cut it out no it's fine i'm just fucking around okay. it's that pete <laughs> all right <laughs> Uh, a woman just became pregnant while already pregnant. Oh, Jesus oh. Christ. A woman has recently told her story of becoming pregnant whilst already pregnant, resulting in her giving birth to two children who were not conceived at the same time and had s- different sets of parents. I'm not in shape, just- but I don't know how to perform an abortion. <laughs> Uh, Jessica Allen, a 31-year-old from California, underwent in vitro fertilization in April 2016 after she agreed to become a surrogate mother for a Chinese couple for the sum of $30,000. I'm already damn. getting arrested. I might as well grab this guy's dick. Uh, California is one of the few U.S. states with legal commercial surrogacy programs where you can be paid to be a surrogate mother. That's using your uterus to get paid. Why are you coming to public swimming pools? That's well, that that won't help. Uh, Dude, <laughs> Jessica gets hard, so now it's time to plow. <laughs> Play that one again. Dude finally gets hard, so now it's time to plow. <laughs> you were talking about surrogacy, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> look, uh, look I, told- I'm not playing this one out of good taste, okay? A yeah, baby gets right. stabbed and I come like that. <laughs> <laughs> See, it would be bad taste for me to play that. <laughs> well, I mean, was it worse that I laughed about it, though? <laughs> My love of dead kids. Holy shit. <laughs> Man, Woo. that was just... been buried for a while, hadn't it? <laughs> Dude, the unsubscribes are palpable right now. <laughs> oh, God, Jesus. But how many, like, fucking dead kid fucking clips do we have? Another one right there. I, I know, I was going to say that somehow that's a clip now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, they're just they they soar in numbers. <laughs> just Jessica was told she was actually carrying twins following a routine ultrasound in her six week of pregnancy. And other her pay- sex news. Her payment was increased by five thousand dollars for the second child, as doctors in the surrogacy agency simply assumed she had unexpectedly became pregnant with twins. Always oh, looking for Wang. She went on to give birth to two boys via cesarean section later that year in December. A month later, she received a photo of the two boys from the Chinese couple with a message saying, They are not the same, right? Have you thought about why they are different? (laughs) She states, She did notice that one was much lighter than the other, and they were obviously not identical twins. And we're back to dicks. That or they just had a bukkake mouth party. (laughs) Oh, that was DNA. badly timed. I know, right? And it, I actually thought you just said it. We do you have a clip like that? Yes, that is a clip. <laughs> I've mixed them into the fucking. I've mixed them into the soundboard a little too well. It's starting to sound like we're actually just saying shit. <laughs> It sounded like you just said it. I'm like, whoa. Hey, all right. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yep, that's weird. (laughs) There we go. Uh, So DNA test confirmed the suspicion. It would show that one baby was Alan's biological child and the other baby was the Chinese couple child. I I don't know how to describe it. We were floored at it, Jessica. We were like, how did this happen? Hey, bro, I can't get it up. The loving three-way with a corpse? (laughs) Uh, This is a phenomenon known as super... 
super fetidation is extremely rare because the most uh, most majority of cases, a pregnant woman's body releases hormones to stop ovulation. In this case, however, Jessica's body continued to ovulate, releasing an egg that managed to become fertilized. Since super fetidation is rare in humans, scientists and practitioners actually know very little about how and why it happens. Fortunately, both children are now fit and healthy. After a complicated and pricey legal process, Jessica and her partner, Jasper, received custody of their son in February and named him uh, Malachi. It's going to cost you some serious cock. Oh, he's looking for Wang. Uh, in the article for the New York Post called, I rented out my womb and they almost took my own son. That's a fucking clip. Jessica finished by saying she doesn't regret becoming a surrogate mom because that would mean regretting her son. She hopes that other women considering surrogacy can learn from her story and that a greater good will come out of this nightmare. Afraid of vaginas? So, no, that, I mean, you can get pregnant. I never knew that could happen. We learned something tonight on the show, everyone. We I'm not in shape, but I don't know how to perform an abortion. I didn't learn how to get, well, I, I'm, I'm working out, but I don't know if I can learn how to do an abortion. That cock and shit, it's like metal. It really is. It is metal. Totes metal. You still padding out the episode with more shit? <laughs> oh, Jesus. I found one more horrible baby clip. All right. Play it. This is my baby, and I'll drown it in a bathtub if I want to. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, between the Tarantino bashing and the 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 fucking uh, baby clips, unsubscribe, unsubscribe, uns- unsubscribe. We're, we're down to maybe one other listener who hates Tarantino babies as much as we do. <laughs> And my mom, who loves me too much to admit that she's listening to the episode just to find out more about my life. Yeah. <laughs> That's just, ooh, man. Uh, that'll so be our last Hi, Mrs. Psyops. That'll be our final listener, yeah. <laughs> you know what? That's a really good fucking way to end it. Because that'll really bump people out and it's unsubscribe, unsubscribe. Yep, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. unsubscribe. Thanks, for, thanks for it all, man. <laughs> If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Go Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.
damn it, I'm getting sucked in again. I swear, it's not me trying to pad out the episode just to see how many listeners we can keep. Not at all. Yep. Just <laughs> keep appropriating all that culture. What? I'm sorry. What? Who said that? <laughs> You're saying just, that's what? Are you saying that's what I'm doing by playing that music? I'm just trying to get us down to zero. All right. <laughs> Jesus Christ, do you want to not work in podcasting anymore? Because I can keep going without you if that's what you're saying. <laughs> I'm just seeing what it takes to get your mom to stop listening. <laughs> I think I've already said that, and she's probably heard it. <laughs> probably. <laughs> if you'd like to find all of the previous instances that I may or may not have said the thing that made my mother stop listening to this show, if she ever was, that's available <laughs> all previous 295 episodes. Legion mother- Podcast. Dot com forward slash cinema dash psyops. My mother heard, hi, this is Matt Psyop, and then she stopped listening. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts. You could join our Facebook support group to try and make Matt feel better about himself, but he's never in there. That's Cinema Psyops. We just mostly request that you post funny ass shit in there. Like funny yeah, memes. Yeah, but be man. careful. Don't get don't get sucked. Yeah, shit is getting real weird with the rules where they're nailing you for things from years ago before they added that to the rules, but it seems to have settled out a little bit here and there. There's like maybe one or two people, but like we were having like a mass <laughs> purge of people for a while, but it's Dude, gotten it, a little better. It's getting weird everywhere. They're starting to ban certain types of porn from OnlyFans. I did not know that. Yeah. That makes me sad, but okay. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that your, 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 your whole platform's built on one thing and now you're gonna start to ban it i don't know if that's a good business model look what happened to tumblr he sounds like you were an only fan subscriber who was upset about the content not being at your fingertips anymore no it sounds like i'm an only fans operator who's my contact's been blocked now <laughs> i think i got a clip for that i make money from my sex work uh, i well i used to <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore. You can find Matt on Facebook as Matt Psyop, and I guess ask him a few questions about that weird shit, because that's a strange revelation for you. Yeah, right. You can that's also weird. find me on Facebook as Court Psyops, and I would just like to state that while I support sex workers and online sex workers, I also am not one, and you're welcome for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was what my OnlyFans was, is to pay me to keep my clothes on. <laughs> That's right. We have joked about making them for that. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing sweaters on for tips. Yep. Hey, listen, I'll throw a jacket on. <laughs> Email feedback to Matt. Tell him that bringing that bit back was not worth the effort. Sign up Matt at gmail.com. Well, I put so little effort in anything else. It wasn't a lot. <laughs> you can email feedback to court, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. Let him know to let up on Tarantino. The guy tries. He's just a coke-addled weirdo. <laughs> I mean, he seems nice enough. <laughs> I don't think so, but okay. Yeah, I don't, I mean, you're probably right. I'm, I'm just... <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to agree with the listener. You can try and convert Matt on Twitter to the opposite way of thinking. He's there as at Psyop Matt. I'm available there as at court underscore Psyop. We also have our meme drops on Instagram. That is available there at cinema underscore Psyops. That's where you're going to get all of those high quality memes. Basically for your work week, your Monday through Friday work dump. Yes, <laughs> all of them high quality memes. I'm a connoisseur. I, 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 I definitely curate that. I try to give you collections to where three things have something in common when I can. I try. Yeah. I try to make the memes worthwhile every day. You always make the memes worthwhile. You do good work. <laughs> I just want to bring a little joy into your life, folks, because it's not going to get there without a little help from your friends. So kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch.
you need to delete. In between here is the noise you need to delete. Hello, hello. Hey, I can hear you. Cool. I didn't hear the ringing. That was weird. Weird? Yeah. <laughs> For once, the ringing didn't come through, but your voice is, so that's all that really matters, I suppose. I would assume that's the most important thing. It's more important that you record your voice on your end, though. And I am doing that. One, two, three. All right, so we're starting about an hour late, so let's get rocking and rolling. Let's do it. Here we go. I've only seen bits and pieces of Kill Bill. <laughs> I've never seen it full on through, so. Oh, no, that's not true. You did watch Lady Snowblood. Oh, okay, I gotcha. <laughs> He's the foot-obsessed Mate of the United States, my friend. I mean, I don't doubt you. <laughs> Somebody out there just rage quit this podcast oh, over that statement. Just, just pounded their desk, broke their laptop. I'm going to fucking tell those guys off later. <laughs> unsubscribe, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. Unsubscri- Fuck these guys. <laughs> It was released in 73. 73. It feels like a movie that could have been released uh, a a month ago. It feels like a movie that could have been made by Quentin Tarantino in the early 2000s. (laughs) Because it looks almost exactly the same. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, maybe even Robert Rodriguez, you know, those two kind of did the same thing. Uh, Or just Robert Rodriguez did things and Quentin Tarantino decided to say, hey, can you put my name on that as well? Oh, they worked together sometimes, yes, if that's what you're implying. Now you're going too far, sir. Quentin Tarantino Tarantino does, in fact, direct films himself and write things himself. That does happen. It just so happens that he literally steals from every movie ever made. Those are his words. (laughs) Well, I was just saying that uh, it feels like Robert Rodriguez does a lot of work and Quentin Tarantino goes, hey, can I put my name on that as well, man? Wow, that's low. All right, enough Quentin Tarantino bashing. We've lost right. literally every listener every, we've ever had. Every listener's gone. <laughs> Nobody's coming back. All right. Three men take her into a barn, and they rape her as the lady watches and laughs. And so, also directs and encourages and tells them yeah. what to do like it's fucking Mother's Day all over again. Yeah, it's, um, it's some gross-ass shit. If our boy Ken from Rhode Island's still here after all the Quentin Tarantino bashing, he'll like that I made a reference to Mother's Day because that was for him. Okay, well then there, everyone should be happy now. Can we just, everyone settle down. <laughs> I feel like I feel like we've been abandoned already anyway cuz people just consume this show and then like throw memes up in the group every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't even know if people like the show anymore if they just hang out in our group cuz we're a bunch of like-minded weirdos. Like I can't even tell. Um <laughs> Both? <laughs> little column A, little column B. I would hope so, but I just don't know anymore. All right, enough about uh, my sure anxiety. Right let's is. let's do this review. Nobody cares. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's important but, to note that the guy was at that specific grave of a yeah. an enemy of hers. Yeah, you just don't like listening to me. So anyway, I... Uh, <laughs> No, no, it's, I, I needed to point that out. I just neglected to realize that we were at that point. Oh, <laughs> so, um. And you're moving like a machine anyway, so I got to fuck up and mess yeah, you up Yeah, fuck me up a little bit. Yeah, you're Let doing, me, you're doing too, spot. you're doing too fucking good right now. I'm and that's too not efficient what the, right now? Yeah, the people don't like it, Matt. They don't <laughs> like it. They don't like it when I succeed. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like you being good at what you do. <laughs> That's not what the people pay for. They pay for me to fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> and here we go. Wait, is somebody uh, paying for the show? Because I'm not getting any money for it. <laughs> oh, I thought you were. I'm not getting any money either. Motherfucker. <laughs> Where's all the money going? <laughs> I'm losing money on this. Where did we, where did we put the money? <laughs> This podcast is hemorrhaging money, Matt. There's some, there's some guy right now who's like, ah, oh shit, those assholes are figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> right? Shit! <laughs> Abandon it!
watching ladies cut dudes into shreds is a thing I'm into. It's just that it's destroying my bloodshed boner, okay? If your bloodshed boner lasts more than four hours, see it done. How many, like, fucking dead kid fucking clips do we have? I rented out my womb. All right, we're out. (laughs) All right. And I have stopped recording.